Honestly speaking, photography is uh, simply a tool for me to express um, a lot of ideas. Um, I'm actually a passionate nature lover and wildlife enthusiast. So for me, photography is just a medium of expression. It's just a tool that I use to express many things related to my actual passion, which is nature and wildlife. Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. Wow, that that's fantastic. So, uh, it's, is it, do I say your name, Jayanth, or is it, Jay, like, where do I put the stress? Uh, Jayanth. Jayanth, okay. Jayanth yeah. Sharma. That's right. A, a fantastic name. Um, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Uh, it's, it's a strange podcast, because podcasts are audio, and we talk about photographs. But the photographs are really just how I get to learn about and share you know, what makes you tick. And so I, I stumbled upon your, your incredible photography and I reached out and you, you know, were very, very kind, very kindly uh, agreed to join me. And so you sent me some photos. You sent me four, well, you sent me more than four, but I, I've selected four and they're all mind blowingly good. You're, Thank you. These are incredible. Um, so Let's just dive in, and then we'll get to learn a little bit about who you are. Okay, so the first one, uh, just so I can describe it, is... Uh, it's, it's nuts. It's uh, a photograph of a giraffe standing on a grassy kind of savanna, stretch of savanna, I guess. Um, the... The land that the giraffe is on is quite flat. There's just a hint of, of what looks like might be acacia trees off towards the horizon. The, the lighting hitting the giraffe is very high key, so it's like the contrast is way, way up. The, the pattern on the, on the giraffe is, is really kind of stark and bold. And uh, what really makes the photograph as well is the sky... Uh, is quite like dark gray to dark blue. It's quite dark, but there's the 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 prism of a of a rainbow off in the distance. And so, for anybody who's listening to this, you have to go to the website or to YouTube or whatever to see this image. This image, it's just it it blows your brain up because it's just incredible. So so walk us through this photograph. Sure. Uh, so as I said, right, I'm, I'm mostly using the camera to express a lot of things. So for me, um, being a wildlife photographer, um, wildlife photography is not just documentation of what I see in nature. Also, it's a form of art for me. So I'm more of a creative nature photographer than somebody who documents, um, let's say, a species or, an, or, a, or a behavior or some activity and stuff like that. So it so happened that uh, this is Masai Mara in Kenya. It's uh, it's a savanna, as you said. And in the early afternoons in some months, uh, it rains a lot. So um, because of the proximity to Lake Victoria, precipitation on most afternoons around four, you can expect rain here. Mm -hmm. And which means uh, it's actually quite a bright, sunny afternoon otherwise. But then the clouds are gathering because of the precipitation. And then... Uh, that's how you see this re really dark cloud in the background of the giraffe and the, and the you know horizon there. Mm -hmm. So behind my back uh, was the sun, and behind I mean uh, on the background of my photograph is this dark clouds. Mm -hmm. So I, I very well remember I was facing southwest uh, when I saw this giraffe. To be honest, it rained uh, it rained very heavily that afternoon, and we were just covered completely. And we it was so bad that it was raining so heavy that we couldn't actually even open our windows. So we were chit-chatting inside the car, waiting for the rain to stop. As soon as it did, I stood up to remove the hood of the car. And that's when I saw the rainbow. Mm -hmm. The moment, moment I saw the rainbow, I told my driver guide, Matt, that, um, you know, uh, this, is, this is basically because of experience, that when I see a great background, mm -hmm. I know I need a good foreground. So I stood up on the seats of the car, and started looking around in every direction. It didn't matter in the direction of the rainbow or anywhere for that matter. And I don't exactly remember where, but I found five giraffes walking across at a distance. Mm -hmm. So I jumped into the car and I yelled at my driver guide and said, uh, Matt, I would like you to drive at 
three o'clock or four o'clock, and please pardon me, I don't exactly remember the direction. Mm-hmm. So in the car, when we speak of uh, uh, an hour or a clock, uh, the head of the car is twelve o'clock, the tail is six o'clock. On the right side at ninety degrees is three o'clock. On the left side at ninety degrees is nine o'clock. Because I'm sitting behind the driver, I won't be able to tell him go there or go here because he's not even seeing you. Mm-hmm. But the moment I tell him go to nine o'clock quickly, mm-hmm. he knows he needs to turn the car left ninety degrees and start driving. Right. And this being a savanna, uh, all I had to tell him was the direction of the giraffe, and I said, "Please race towards that place because the rainbow won't last forever." For sure. So while he started driving, um, I instructed. You know, I teach photography. I conduct photography tours. I instructed a couple of participants in my, um, you know, Land Cruiser that we are actually heading towards um, a giraffe. Uh, and of course, the rainbow size wouldn't change um, wherever we are. Mm-hmm. So we started going towards the giraffe, and um, I I instructed my driver guy to align the car in such a way that we were about twenty to thirty seconds before the giraffe coincides the rainbow. Mm-hmm. And um, most of us used a smaller lens, and we did uh, take a cliche uh, curved rainbow in the horizon with um, animals in the frame, and that was a fantastic shot. But uh, that was not the end of the shot for me. That was the beginning. So mm-hmm. what I did was, I dropped the smaller camera down, which which was a seventy two hundred millimeter, and I picked up a super telephoto lens, which was a four hundred millimeter two point eight lens. Mm-hmm. And um, I instructed Matt in such a way that now I started asking him to reverse the car. Right. Everybody in my car were uh, a little surprised that we we've come running towards the giraffe now, and you're asking him to go farther. Mm-hmm. So my idea was um, to minimize the size of the giraffe in my composition, so that I could fit the giraffe entirely in a super telephoto lens. Mm-hmm. Now this is a very interesting lesson for people to learn. Um, so what happens when you go close? You get an animal which is bigger. When you go far, the animal becomes smaller. That is everybody's. Uh, I mean, it's a very common knowledge. Sure. Now what I did was I used a longer lens, so that I could magnify the rainbow. But I wanted to demagnify the giraffe, mm-hmm. so I reversed the car by around two hundred, three hundred, four hundred meters. I don't know how many, how much distance. All I knew was seeing through the viewfinder, telling him to go, keep going, keep going, mm-hmm. keep going, keep going, until one point where I said stop. Now uh, the distance from me and the uh, giraffe changed by a lot of uh, extent, which, mm-hmm. which is why the giraffe became smaller. But if you think about it, the distance from the rainbow and my camera hardly changed because it's a, such a huge distance. Yeah. And going hundred meters, two hundred meters behind wouldn't make much of a difference if you think about it. Mm-hmm. So that's how I could um, maintain a large rainbow and minimize the size of the giraffe in my frame. And thus was this photo uh, born uh, by creative thinking on the spot. Mm-hmm. No, that's it's okay. So I've been doing photography for. Uh, decades uh, so i've been around images for a very long time and obviously uh a f- and i'm drawn to wildlife and and nature photography and i can honestly say i have never seen a photograph of a giraffe like this before it's it's just so eye catching and that's the thing about the photographs that i've seen of your work i i realize i realize it's uh it's the you know, I get to see the, the 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 best of the best, or whatever that you know your your better shots. But the quality of your images is just it's just spectacular. And so, yeah, I was just like, I need to have you on my podcast because these are just unbelievable. And and I have to point out, I have to point out, you know, you're representing. You're the first guest. I'm happy to say you're the first guest from India. So thank you. Privileged. <laughs> so where are you right now? Uh, I'm in um, the peninsular India in a city called Bangalore. We call this the Silicon Valley of India. Right. So high tech city, mm-hmm. uh, Bangalore. So uh, yeah, I know Bangalore as being a, a city of like a lot of you know software and and on different kind of developers and, and like high tech. Uh, so is there a reason why you're in Bangalore for? Is it for work or is it, is it just happens to be that that's where you grew up? Like why? What's the, the connection between you and Bangalore? Right, right. So uh, I was actually born in a city about um, one fifty kilometers from Bangalore called Mysore, which is a heritage culturally rich city. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually ended up in an IT job in two thousand one, and I started moving to Bangalore in two thousand three. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I worked for multinational companies like Accenture, America Online oh, for wow. a while uh, before I actually gave up my IT career to uh, take up full-time photography. So huh. uh, I came to Bangalore for work and um, for doing entrepreneurial uh, stuff and being um, you know, audacious, uh, this is the big city. I wouldn't be able to pull off what I did in my own hometown. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. But so, for example, like, okay, so you give photography workshops and, and lessons and tours so you, you teach photography um <clears throat> so how how do you live as a photographer like what's what's your what like who are you what's your life like i, I like it's right. amazing to Shh. inspire people like here's this guy living in sure. india being a professional photographer so so take us through your right so ran i was 25 26 when i started winning awards and getting my pictures on cover pages and I realized I was pretty good at it. Um, I'm actually a a reasonably good instructor and a teacher in anything I can teach. Um, So it need not be photography. I can teach web design as passionately and, you know, creatively as I do photography. So I realized very early that uh, after I quit my, you know, job and tried to become a photographer full time uh, without really knowing too much about the world of uh, wildlife photography, I realized very soon that I wouldn't be able to make a living just selling photos and prints and stock and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, since I had a combination of uh, two, three skills, one is uh, excellent um, teaching abilities and reasonably um, um, high tech savviness, being a user experience designer, website designer and stuff like that. And uh, most importantly, knowing my uh, photography well, I combined the three and I realized instead of struggling to sell my photos and being a freelance photographer, Mm -hmm. I became an entrepreneur where I came up with a company called Toehold, which uh, doesn't need to sell photos to make a living, needs to sell how to click photos to make a living. Mm -hmm. And from going uh, on to becoming a photography instructor, I became a photography entrepreneur where I hired more people. We started a company in in the pre-COVID times. We were in three major cities in India and we have a whole host of services related to the photography enthusiast as our customer. Oh, wow. For example, uh, we do workshops, which is the smallest part of our offering. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have a camera rental business, which uh, operated in three cities before COVID. Right now it operates in uh, Bangalore, where I live, and uh, in a forest uh, around Bangalore called uh, Kabini, mm-hmm. where we have a small rental store. Oh, wow. Apart from teaching and providing camera gear on hire, I operate photography tours across the globe. I have a uh, footprint on six continents, uh, from the Arctic to Antarctica, to the Far East of Russia, to Central America, North America, Africa, uh, a lot of places in Europe, uh, including the Arctic and stuff like that. So it's a travel company with a photography perspective. Wow. And uh, at the peak of our, um, you know, workforce, we were 35 people full-time employed um, just before COVID uh, happened. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. So, so much. So good. So good. So, so impressive. Okay. So in my day job, what I do is I do a lot of business consulting. So I have done indirectly some work with Accenture. Um, I've I, In Hong Kong, I have... A, uh, management consulting or business consulting company myself, much smaller scale I- in terms of staff than uh, what you right. described. But uh, what what I did for a very long time was focus on articulating for entrepreneurship. Like what is the essence of entrepreneurship? How do we get to that? And eventually uh, landed in, in this area called uh, service network leadership, uh, mm-hmm. So, spent the past fifteen years looking at leadership and service, right. and so I am fascinated. I, well, no, I'm not. Fa- I'm I am impressed and amazed and really drawn by your photograph. I'm, as I'm talking, I have this incredible photo of this lone giraffe walking on this very beautiful green savanna with behind it this out of focus unbelievable uh rainbow so your image really is just it just just you know explodes off the, my monitor but when i hear you talk about your 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 development and where you are now as a, as an entrepreneur i have all of these other questions you know all of these other sort of reactions to that so when covid suddenly came up in bangalore 
how did you guys react? Like at first, like what 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 were the uh, the thoughts and the feelings, and and how did it even kind of um, break into your consciousness? Right. Um, so I remember tenth uh, of March or eighth of March, twenty twenty. I was on my way back from the Himalayas. I was leading a snow leopard expedition. You and, sound uh, like you have the worst life. <laughs> Uh, th- those those 15 days were really tough. <laughs> that is amazing. Okay, but go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So when I came back to civilization, because we don't have network in the mountains, and when I came back to civilization, I started hearing about Wuhan. I started hearing about COVID. I started hearing about the virus and all of that. But I, I honestly didn't realize, you know, we have been through swine flus. We have been through Ebola's. We have been through all of these in the past. So no way we could have imagined what was going to come in the months to, uh, you know, uh, come uh, across. So we basically, all I was worried about back then when I was, you know, uh, driving two days from the mountains to the nearest airport was uh, to ensure my American guest would uh, be able to fly back home um, mm-hmm. because we were hearing about airports getting, you know, um, you know, blocked a uh, lot of queues and stuff like that. So fortunately, he, uh, he went back and, um, you know, we, we all got back home. Around 15th of March, I remember we started seeing issues and we started getting into some kind of a confinement. And India had the first lockdown on the 23rd of March uh, or 22nd of March, I vaguely remember, Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's when I realized that this is uh, something else. This is not just a typical, um, you know, uh, outbreak of some disease or something like that. It's it's epic. Sure. And um, I didn't waste too much time being a tech savvy person. I already remember 27th March was my first webinar. So I already was pretty good on social media and had a lot of uh, activities going on. So I remember the last week of March was a lot of fun Instagram lives and Facebook lives and, you know, uh, um, inspirational messages and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I suddenly realized, hey, this is not going to stop in a week or two. This may go on for a month or two. Mm. Um, And I had to start thinking about the next month's expenses and revenue and all of that. So... I didn't waste too much time. I used to do classroom workshops for 20, 25 people because we have a, a classroom infrastructure. But uh, that that's when Zoom came into prominence and I started taking virtual classes and uh, webinars. And uh, the whole month of April, I taught some 125 people uh, online. And um, then I started doing a weekly webinars on different topics on photography. And so I think we quickly adapted from being... a uh, on the field to uh, in the classroom to a virtual uh, photography instructional service and uh, that's when we started thinking how do we survive the you know non travel situation amazing and thankfully in india anything you do you get a lot of volumes so uh, huh. i was blessed with uh, reasonably um, a good number of uh, photography enthusiasts who were also locked up and wanted to learn something sure. and they all came to my class okay wow well, you know what? I think what we'll do is we'll we'll use that as a kind of natural pause to to go on to the next photograph because I each one needs to get its time in the in the spotlight because your photographs are just absolutely fantastic. The next image um, we have is okay, so it's called Polar Bear on Ice, and sure enough, you you get around. Uh, so just to describe. For, okay, so it's, so essentially, the, there's the curvature because of because of your lens. It's a very wild. It's not a. It's probably a 14 millimeter lens or something. So it's a very wide angle shot. the The horizon is really curved, right? So you get this feeling like uh, it's almost like oh, we're on the planet, and the planet is curved. So even though it's essentially three quarters of the image is um, dark ocean or sea sea with all these broken bits of of ice and you can just see the sun over the horizon and the 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 sky is quite uh, overcast and on these massive flows of ice uh there's it's it's half half so half of it is water and half of it is exposed chunks of ice and there's this one lone polar bear kind of it looks it's a very stark image but it's almost hopeful because it's it's mostly monochromatic because of the dark the darkness of the sea and the whiteness of the of the ice and then the paleness of the sky but the sun and the polar bear have this sort of warm warmth to it um so 
why don't you t- talk to us about this image? Sure. Uh, apart from the fact that it has won me a lot of prizes, I would I would like to explain what what went through when I did this image. So it was an Arctic expedition, Svalbard. Um, this was the autumn in Svalbard, uh, which is September. Um, I mean, for an expedition like the Arctic, you cannot be like in Africa having an exclusive jeep or a land cruiser. You have to share your ship with multiple people. Uh-huh. And um, I remember um, I was with 35 photographers on this expedition because it's an expensive trip. Wow. Uh, the more the people, the lesser the cost. Um, I do myself conduct expeditions where the cost is ten, ten thousand five hundred dollars, where only ten, twelve people are there. But wow. this one was. Uh, uh, a, a relatively less expensive uh, photography expedition, you know, which was organized by my Norwegian partners. And we were around 35 people on board. We we do hear a knock on the door when somebody spots a polar bear at a distance uh, from the bridge of the ship. And that's when we start putting on our uh, warm clothing, our, um, you know, hoodies and gloves and shoes and all of that. And we rush to the deck, upper deck of the ship. So that we see the animal and most often we see it at a distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, likewise, uh, we all carry a super telephoto lens, a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. And we all went up and we saw this polar bear was at quite a distance, maybe about 400, 500 meters when I first saw him. And um, I don't know if it was a him or her, it's tough to Mm -hmm, (laughs) recognize mm -hmm. bears. Uh, it It was a bear which was sitting on a chunk of ice. Now, as the ship started slowing down and slowly started getting closer and closer to the bear, we realized this bear was not afraid of the ship at all. So we make fun of these kind of bears, call, calling them photo bears. Okay. Uh, there are two kinds of polar bears that I have come across. One which sees a ship and simply runs away. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suspect that is because of the experience it has had with uh, poaching or with with hunters and stuff like that because polar bears can be transcontinental they can be hunted in russia and uh, they escape and come to europe and they go to canada where they're hunted again maybe so so there are some bears which see the ship and just run away Mm -hmm. Uh, while there are some who who see the ship and they show a sense of curiosity and inquisitiveness and they start coming closer maybe they smell the bacon in the kitchen i don't know so um, this one was a photo bear Mm -hmm. in our uh, terminology So it started walking towards the ship while the ship started slowly drifting towards the bear. And that's when we started clicking pictures. And like everybody else, I started using my telephoto, getting the whole bear in my frame. And then when it came very close, I realized I started using a 70 to 200 millimeter and everybody were firing. All I could hear was 35 people into 5, 7, 8, 10 frames per second. And it was like a cacophony of shutter frames uh, being um, you know heard mm-hmm. but uh, i don't know how i realized that um, the only way to be making a picture which was different here was to um, you know try and do something which the 34 of them were not doing and uh, i instantly uh, picked up my 24 to 70 millimeter lens mm-hmm. and i started framing the shot in a wide angle and I do have a lot of frames which are not a fisheye perspective, right. where uh, the horizon is rectilinear and it's a straight line. And uh, I did capture a lot of habitat images, as we call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, environmental shots. So the the, the thing which makes me in uh, this this photo an interesting photo for me is it it narrates the plight of the polar bear in some ways uh, mm-hmm. because the polar bear is uh, losing the ice below its feet uh, due to global warming, climate change, and stuff like that. Uh, on this very expedition, I did see a lot of polar bears which were stranded on islands which didn't have any ice around it, which meant they had to wait for the next season sea ice to form and the drift ice to come before they ventured out on the sea uh, long distances to find uh, seals and walruses and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So um, there was this opportunity where it was not uh, um, you know, uh, impossible to do a wide angle shot. So it was very uh, natural for a creative photographer to envision wide angle Mm -hmm. but then i realized um what if i use a different lens because many people are also creative they were also doing wide angles and uh, um, there were also some landscape photographers using natural i mean neutral density grad filters on a wide angle to shoot the sky better and stuff Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. that's when i realized uh, the opportunity is the same lenses can be similar the only way to make this different is to produce um, something different so i remember running down two floors on the ship from the upper deck to the lower deck to my cabin in the basement, opening my bag because a fish oil lens is not something you carry around all the time. Sure. It was in my cabin in my bag and wearing those um, huge, um, you know, apparels like you're a, you're an, you're an uh, astronaut. Mm-hmm. You can't walk like you walk on normal streets. So it's so much of uh, clothing. So I ran down uh, to my cabin, uh, found the fish eye lens 
I remember this was a Canon 815 fisheye oh, wow. um which which is a full frame fisheye lens which means at 8 mm you get an entire circle yeah uh, back back in the day I was a Canon user now I'm a Sony ambassador so I actually ran up with that 815 lens and I unmounted my Canon 5D Mark III which had a 2470 or a 7200 I can't remember precisely and I mounted the 815 on it and at 15 mm was a fisheye perspective mm-hmm. at 8 mm it would be an entire circular fisheye yeah. lens so at the 15 mm i composed a few shots by that time i had lost uh, maybe about 7 8 minutes um i don't know what the others would have got in those 7 8 minutes i sacrificed uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of images <laughs> uh, but by this time the the polar bear had probably lost its interest it didn't like the bacon it didn't like the people yeah. and it started walking away and um, as i came up to the deck panting i just saw the bear's back and it was walking away and um, this is a shot which was probably after it started walking 15 20 feet from where we last saw it yeah. and then it uh, vanished into the uh, horizon and we didn't follow the bear any longer because it's not uh, a good idea to um, you know disturb the bear no. um, we wait waited for the bear to come close to us we enjoyed a few minutes when the bear lost lost interest and started walking away we didn't want to pursue it any right. further So this was the shot just before it left us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Yeah, it, it's you obviously know your your gear, you know your your you clearly experience and you understand your 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 basically your your tools. And sure enough, for a lot of images and in a way it's kind of the one of the kind of the the pillars of the podcast is so what kind of story are you going to tell with your images right so everybody is going to be drawn to making certain images for example the the very strong zoom to get in that that tight telephoto shot and then for whatever reason you your brain says i'm going to go in a different direction i'm going to get my my fish eye very wide lens and then this image if anything precisely because of climate change and and the the challenges that we're all like you're a guy who like you're right now talking to me from Bangalore in India I'm sitting in Hong Kong and we're discussing a photograph of you in the arctic connected by the 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 kind of the challenge of climate change and uh it's 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 astounding and it's profound and and so what was the most surprising uh consequence or or effect or a reaction that you got to this one particular image because you said you've won awards for it but what was the surprising i mean winning an award of course is always nice and it's a surprise but what was the one stand out surprising reaction to this image that you thought was either encouraging or discouraging um one is uh, photographically of course there was a lot of uh, attention to the image because it's uh, a little unique uh, it's not a cliche uh, portrait um but keeping aside keeping aside the photography element just looking at the actual intention of why i take pictures it was a conversation starter because a lot of people could actually use a photograph to um you know depict a discussion like for example we all speak about um climate change and global warming sea ice melting and polar bears thriving and stuff like that but you know how can you show a lot of these in one image um yeah. which was which was which was probably um the best thing that happened with respect to this image people could talk about so many such things showing this image because you know it it's the plight of a polar bear it's the um shrinking sea ice it's the melting ice it's the fragmented uh, ice flows it's uh Uh, it's like the polar bear is walking away from you which is like a philosophical it's a metaphor for you know you're, you're losing the animal from mm-hmm. your planet kind of a feeling mm-hmm. uh, so it was poetic for me and also a lot of people could relate to it uh, from that perspective apart from it just being a sharp photo with a beautiful sky or a you know a photographically speaking um, apart from that it it struck a chord with a common man for i sure. do remember it had all kinds of discussions i did have a lot of people who also were um, completely contradicting my interest and they were asking me hey we have a lot of issues in india itself why do you need to go to uh, <laughs> the arctic to take pictures of uh, polar bears to you know discuss conservation mm-hmm. and uh, all of that so this is an image i used to tell uh, people in india that uh, exactly like what you said you're sitting in hong kong i'm in india but why are we talking about the arctic because 
um, everything that we do in India affects the Arctic and what happens to the Arctic affects India. Yeah. So that, that interrelation between uh, poles and polar regions and, um, you know, virtually even the rainforest and everywhere in the globe to where we are is something which is not very easy for a common man to understand. Sure. Uh, they, they think it's a, it's a, I- India is a political boundary. So you need to work on tigers if you're an Indian wildlife photographer. And I did get comments that, you know, we have the Sundarbans, which is a mangrove and we have uh, tigers suffering there because of, you know, tidal, um, you know, uh, for example, cyclones and mm-hmm. all of that. So I use this image to say that if you protect the Arctic, uh, if you if you make sure the global warming, uh, you know, slows down, the sea ice melting slows down, that's when the mangroves will not die because the water levels won't rise. Sure. And that is how you can ensure that you protect a tiger. So if you don't learn the problems of the Arctic, you're not going to save the tiger in India. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of conversation I can have with an image like this, um, which which is probably the most precious thing for me. That's great. Fantastic. Through the podcast, my, 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 my mission is also to kind of share uh, great photographs to other audiences, to other people, uh, and hopefully through a conversation that, that inspires them to find out either more about you or about your work, and, and also just to get connect with this image, because it is, it is really powerful. It is just really great. Your photographs are all just bonkers great. The next one is entitled Puma Patagonia. And you really understand framing and light. And and so some people describe photographers as light chasers, right? So in this case, um, what we have is the foreground is, um, it's in that golden hour, I guess. So it's during sunset, maybe sunrise. And... The foreground is this hill a very kind of rough, dry, brownish kind of grass in it. And sorry, in the, in the background is this very dark gray, super sharp, but still dark gray. And, and really kind of when you look at inhospitable mountain peaks, very, very sharp peaks. So these, this looks like, a, like okay, the, the title of the photograph is Patagonia. So uh you know that the this mountain range is relatively new, so the peaks are extremely sharp. There's a bit of snow. There's a lot of uh, exposed rock. the The sky is very um, uh, turbulent. There's there's a bit of sun, a bit of sky. But what's you know what makes the image is this puma that's, I guess, resting on its ha- on its back haunches, but its front are kind of extended, and so it's just kind of looking a little bit towards you and beyond you maybe it's looking at the sun um and it's just it's, it's an incredible photograph I, again so what what's the story behind this image so for people who uh, probably are seeing this image um, would um, recognize this landscape it's a very famous landscape in patagonia in uh, chile this uh, mountain range i mean this park national park is called torres del paine uh, which translates to the towers of paine so as you can see, these towers in the background, they, I mean, if you ask me, they are broken after a volcanic eruption or something like that. Mm-hmm. You can see the big, um, what can I say, um, uh, the caldera of this volcano there, um, which is a light gray portion of the, of the frame. Wow. So um, I'm, I'm in this national park, which is not, um, you know, to be honest, very few people go here to find the Pumas. There's a lot of trekkers, hikers, uh, campers, um, you know, uh, mountaineers, bikers. Uh, who go here to enjoy the adventure of uh, Patagonia. So uh, in the southern part of Patagonia, it's uh, it's a town called Porto Natales, uh, which is uh, in, in the southern part of Chile, you know, uh, maybe a thousand miles from the bottom tip of uh, South America. So uh, here, Pumas um, live in the area and some private ranches, which are hundreds and hundreds of hectares of uh, private land, um, are used uh, to graze horses and, you know, maybe cattle and stuff like that. But then uh, there are also the natural prey species of the puma, which is called the guanaco, which is a cousin of the llama. Mm -hmm. Now, um, of late, there are some ranches where pumas are sighted quite often. And it's not even 10 years since people are able to say, I'm going to South America, I'm going to Chile, I'm going to Patagonia, I'm going to Towers of Paine to see a puma. Because, you know, 20 years ago, who could imagine... Um, you will go to a place and you'll find a puma. Mm-hmm. So today it's happening there. So I was here 
the way this works is um, you drive a car, you go around different places, you stop the car, you climb up a ridge, use a binoculars or a spotting scope and start scanning the place. At a distance, you will see some guanaco which are very anxious or let's say they are they are alarming or they are calling out or they are afraid of a predator and the only predator which lives here is the puma uh jaguars don't live south uh, so so far south here uh, so pumas are the are the mountain lions as the americans call it mm-hmm. um uh, so so what we did on this particular day was uh, stop the car at sunrise i remember 6:15 6:20 in the morning uh, it was lovely light and uh, we started looking around and we heard some guanaco calls up in the mountain and we took the car off road and started driving up on these um, you know uh, paths uh, which are on the hill mm-hmm. and we stopped the car and there were four pumas which are probably three cubs uh, and a mother uh, which were on the ridge of that hill oh, wow. uh, against uh, against a beautiful uh, orange sky so uh, you're not seeing that photo here but i'm yeah. just describing my first sight mm-hmm. but then Uh, we stopped the car pulled out our tripods the super tele photo lenses and a 7200 mm lens hanging on the side and we started walking towards the puma on foot we were following the puma and i remember at least a half a mile of following the puma taking multiple shots they were sitting in many many places there were three cubs and a mum and uh, it was it was a tough situation it's the mountains it's uh, walking on foot with a super tele photo lens I remember carrying an 800 mm lens on a tripod with a fluid head and uh, I'm I'm um, not the fittest of people in the, <laughs> in the planet uh, along with my heavy bag because I didn't want to leave my bag half a kilometer away to pull out a lens if needed so I carried everything on my back the tripod and the lens and I started walking along wherever possible I would put the tripod on the ground and take some shots and it went on for about half an hour and um it was becoming difficult for us to catch up with the puma we were now starting to just trail the pumas by 100 meters all the time right which meant we would only see the back all the time and then uh, we were trying to you know go parallel to the puma as much as possible and everybody were tired i know i do know there was a, there was a guy who runs marathon he was tired as well uh, it's not just the uh, average fitness guy like mm-hmm. me everybody were tired so what so, what, what's the uh, the um, elevation because you must be at elevation right Sure, I don't think it's too high. Uh, I don't remember the exact elevation, but it's below thousand meters for sure. Okay, okay. It, it's uh, it's on the coast of uh, you know it's it's not too high. Okay, you know, so it's not too high for sure. I can I I think it's below thousand meters for sure. Okay. Um, it was not the altitude problem at all. It's just that climbing up and down sure. hills was sure. a problem. So here's where I realized uh, the puma was sitting. Especially this one. This is a male cub. Um, we named him Simba, and everybody calls him Simba there. The others have different <laughs> names. um and when i saw him sitting he was i was much much behind where i am right now towards his uh, hind or 100 meters towards his hind and then i stopped i took a couple of breaths i took a couple of telephoto lens pictures and then i realized i have completely ignored the background right uh, which was which was the mountain range so i immediately started pulling out my 70 to 200 which was hanging on my side because it was too far for me for uh, getting a portrait of the puma uh, i mean a close up of the puma mm-hmm. So immediately I realized um, it was an habitat image in the making uh, and uh, I the first thing I did was uh, call out all the people in my group and tell them hey guys I want all of you to come where I am don't ask me why please run soon and people <laughs> didn't realize why I'm doing that because all of them are looking at the puma yeah. and thankfully I'm able to envision uh, a perspective which is just beyond the puma and a couple of them made it and some of them stood 50 meters behind 30 meters behind thinking they're near me but um, whoever came closer to me because i couldn't shout because there's an animal there yeah, yeah. you can't can't keep yelling instructions like you're in a safari car so you had to be soft and make sure the puma doesn't run away and it's a wild animal mind you it's uh, and not just one of it there are four of them yeah. um though though the second one is just about 15 meters behind this one and you can't see it because of the elevated uh, mound mm-hmm. uh, so all i was envisioning here was a great um a shot with all the elements of the story coming in 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 one frame like mm-hmm. the the place where we are people who know patagonia know the towers of pine there's right. no need to explain it if you've seen the place or seen the posters yeah. and then the moment they see this photo they know it was shot in patagonia i didn't even have to title it for people who have been here sure of course if you've not been here you wouldn't know the place uh, but but then this was a great opportunity to show a habitat with a landscape 
which is what i love to do in wildlife photography mm-hmm. ran i want to tell something to photography enthusiasts if you allow me please no. um, <laughs> this is your it's it's <laughs> sure. i'm here for sure. you so what i meant was uh, i'm i'm going to say something that you have not asked me so i met a scientist um, uh, who is also uh, inclined towards art once i was very proud of my first few tiger photos and elephant photos which are pretty sharp close ups you can count the whiskers and stuff like that i had a um half an hour drive with him from the place where we met to our uh, respective homes and he asked me jayant i want you to tell me uh, what do you think the tiger looked like in the medieval you know times during let's say 500 ad 1500 ad and stuff like that so i said um, exactly the way it looks like now i, I don't think there's any difference in the tiger 500 years uh, ago then he said what about a thousand years ago when um, you know um, the indian uh, continent was raided or invaded by uh, moguls and uh, mongols and stuff like that so what do you think the tiger was back then i said absolutely the same he said what about 2000 years ago how do you think the tiger looked like i said you know 2000 years is not too much for an animal to change the way it looks like um, probably very similar to how it looks like now mm-hmm. then he said you get the point jent um, so how much more can you keep showing a portrait of an animal which has not changed for 2000 years and which will not even change for another 2000 years perhaps so what do you think is the need for you to do wildlife photography and that got me thinking and i realized hey it's not the animal that is changing it's the world around the animal that is changing mm. and as a wildlife photographer um i'm actually a nature photographer with a subset so i would use wild animals as a prop to show the landscape got it uh, maybe maybe when i show a polar bear with a glacier uh, today and 10 years later somebody looks at my image and they'll see the same glacier and they'll realize oh my goodness the glacier is such such a small glacier now look 10 years ago it was like this mm-hmm. and that is something that photos can show and tell stories to uh, narrate uh, larger stories rather than showing a whisker of a tiger or a polar bear or a puma and that's why i i really changed the way i looked at wildlife photography some 10 years ago and i always want to make a habitat picture of an animal to show the world of the animal mm-hmm. uh, and if possible make a beautiful frame that can be printed yeah no i i i like how you articulated that i haven't heard it put in that way before and for me you know like uh hearing you put it that way is is um it's a nice new let's call it a intuition pump where you can think oh well that make that gets me thinking as well and and very good point very good point and and so um i think w- one of the reasons when why i commented on on the on the landscape of 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 the the mountains right being clearly quite young it's 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 like when you see these exposed mountains that are tall and sharp and you have the snow and everything it it feels so elemental you know in the sense that there there's not tons of of vegetation there's not incredible amounts of wildlife even though there there is some but there's a kind of um purity but also with you know the simplicity of of having things pulled away and removed and so in this like when i see your photograph so the the backdrop of the mountain range which is just rock and snow and sky and so it's black and white and the clouds of the sky and then in the foreground you have this very sharp more living subject matter i guess and and in it is the puma and as you say there is that story and there's that that connection so do you feel that that kind of level needs to be there to have the many kinds of levels need like they need to be there in order to create that nar- narrative so that people can react to it even more or or do you worry about your audience reacting to to the images as much as when when you're in there like how much of your brain is just looking at the scene and how much of your brain is thinking about okay I need to create something that people are going to respond to later sure i have a very very solid answer for this because i keep answering this myself every now and then and Great. it changes over time right um i keep asking my workshop participants uh, who do you take pictures for um and uh, most people say it's for myself i i i do it for myself i feel uh, the thrill of it i feel the satisfaction of it it gives me um you know a lot of um, you know peace of mind and it's like meditation and all of that which is absolutely true 
uh, in my case um, you know i have i have spoken about it in a couple of ted talks of mine where i say i am not a passionate photographer i am a passionate nature lover and photography is my tool mm. so i i keep remembering that and not just saying it uh, because uh, for me when i am on the field i would get the same pleasure of uh, what anybody can get out of this site when i just see it i don't need a photo of it if it is only for myself right so i i always make sure when i'm clicking a photo i consider it uh, i mean it's a very strong opinion i consider it um, a bit of a sacrifice of personal pleasure in order to show something to the rest of the world mm-hmm. that's the kind of uh, strong opinion i have about that which is why i i kind of always want to make images which are for others and not for myself mm-hmm. uh, because i am there to see the animal myself and i've seen it many times i keep going again i will see it again i know so uh, when i think of uh, most frames that i click for as uh, pieces of art that i want to show it to an audience and not uh, make it only for myself or my satisfaction and pleasure i think um, the output is going to be different because you'll start wondering what would i want to show to the audience what would they think about it what would they infer from a scene what is it that i can include so that the story is complete mm-hmm. because not everybody is going to look at this picture and listen to my podcast in my life yeah. so they would just look at the photo and the photo has to communicate to them as well so for me it's a very clear um, purpose photography for me is done so that i show pictures to an audience um i watch wildlife for a personal pleasure i take pictures for uh, clearly a larger audience and my goal is to produce pretty pictures to attract more and more people towards nature and wildlife mm-hmm. and once they are in this um, you know community then they are eligible to be educated about the other problems right right wow well thank you that's uh, very well said and i'm going to use that as uh, the 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 segue or the stepping stone to move to your fourth image which in a way um I didn't I didn't know it was going to be like this but it kind of what I kind of it, you know I I'm a little bit cheeky sometimes so I kind of like the fact that it's going to contradict a little bit of what you had just said as in this photograph it's a tiger with a black background it's just uh so juicy so perfect so incredible it's essentially it's like it looks like a studio photograph of so let's say 85 or 90% of the frame is jet black there's no detail it's all shadow it's all dark and then in this high contrast you have this unbelievably beautiful animal in this kind of all you see is a little bit the little hints of the of the ears you see the eyes the face the the muzzle the whiskers of the mouth the mouth is open uh you see a little bit of the shoulder but it's essentially a tiger in profile looking from left to right and um i'm not doing this to be a jerk you know <laughs> to be an ass but but okay so here we have Here we have a photograph which is completely removed from its back, from its surrounding from its setting and right. and and so how does how does this fit into your into the story that you want to put out today Sure yeah it's it's uh, not that every image i make is a habitat um, you know landscape kind of an image so mm-hmm. what i would call this image uh, is a is a low key spotlight image mm-hmm. so um, the purpose of this image is um, philosophical to me it's like tiger coming out of you know um, nowhere and in, into focus and into light so this was um, so being a designer in the past i i kind of used my creative uh, design skills as much as possible while i take photos mm-hmm. i don't manipulate photos in the sense i don't use photoshop to manipulate a picture and you know make any image on the computer mm-hmm. um so w- with respect to this photo how how this photo was shot is basically a tigress uh, which is very popular in india everybody knows the tigress she, she's called noor and uh, she's walking on the road at around 11 o'clock in the morning um i am the only car there because all the tourists leave at 9:30 and being a special photo permit you can stay the whole day mm-hmm. which means you'll spend the whole day with the tiger wherever the tiger goes you are at a distance and watching it and following it and seeing what it does and here i am reversing my car and the tiger is walking head on towards me and uh, she walks through a forest patch where there's hardly any light because it's 11 am and it's pretty bright sunlight 
but because of the canopy of the trees mm-hmm. it's uh, it's a shadow mm-hmm. so suddenly there is a beam of light falling on the uh, or the or the path and uh, she stops in multiple places to look for spotted deer and look around uh, in multi she's very cautious right so mm-hmm. when she stopped in one such spot i immediately you know um, i'm sure you understand dynamic range and i realized the dynamic range of the shot was pretty um you know um, less because there's a lot of shadows in the frame mm-hmm. and there's a huge beam uh, of light which is falling on the tiger's face so all i had to do was you know i keep telling my workshop participants that i had to close my eyes to envision the shot yeah. if i kept my eyes open i'll only see what the um, you know high dynamic range of my right. eyes can give me so i basically realized that i'll spot meter the tiger and um, uh, exposure lock it so that i would only expose for the places where the light was falling mm-hmm. and because where the light didn't fall was a natural shadow it pushed the shadow towards a complete dark uh, mm-hmm. black and uh, for me this is more of a fine art print rather than uh, um, a- an image which tells you a story uh, because you need all kinds of images uh, to you know for example let's say i make a book on tigers of india i need a lot of negative space to write my book's title sure. and write stuff and st- so being a designer i do make these um, pictures which are not necessarily uh, journalistic uh, photo storytelling images but also abstracts mm-hmm. and also um aesthetically dramatic images um for example and this is just an attempt to make uh, a low key image of this tiger i um yeah it's like if it's one of those funny images that that if anything it's like it's like all of your images are just really perfect you know like they're just really perfect eye candy and so for this as a, as a like i also have a bit of a graphic design uh side to my professional life or whatever and i understand that somebody with layout experience in publishing be it on, online or in print would would look at this image as as the perfect you know the the perfect image for use in in a kind of uh you know use for 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 design purposes and on the other hand on its own just the tiger by itself in the light and because it's the rest is so underexposed and black you really get to appreciate for example the 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 coloring of the the fur and 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 it's a it's a masterful shot so i i don't even know how how old are you uh, i'm 41 you're 41 dude <laughs> you're amazing okay let's pull back let's just pull back the focus a lot and then okay so for whatever reason you channeled your out of necessity and interest and and curiosity whatever decided to create this business where you're bringing photography to people and it's also bringing you into this space of talking about f- photography and all this stuff so talk about talk about your your business like sell sell like it's it's amazing like so so it's uh the website's called what's the web, what's the website and and talk about it's, that it's uh, the brand is called tohold um t o e h o l d tohold.in is our website so, so to- my company is called so to as in your toe and hold just yeah that's okay. right dot i n so tohold tohold is one word uh, in english um um like a foothold uh, tohold is um, you know many people ask me why this name for a company like yours so it's again a little philosophical so if it's a mountaineering terminology uh-huh. when you're climbing a mountain um you need a toehold to grip your toes so that you can climb uh, upper uh, areas so yeah. you can you can get the you know uplift uh, so you need a small place to put your toes in and get the grip and i look at my company and my role in this um, you know uh, cycle of uh, services as a toehold because i i ensure people step on us and they climb greater heights okay. one of my uh, punch lines is called uh, summit up because when you climb on a toe hold you get up and you can summit um, to wherever you want to go to right. uh, so that's uh, the company name as a business uh, as i said uh, we are in our 11th year right now oh, um, wow. and probably the toughest 10th and 11th year i could have imagined <laughs> i had a great plan of celebrating the 10th anniversary <laughs> but then it was in a lockdown on zoom that i wow. had to do it <laughs> wow so uh, yeah it's a challenging phase of uh, business for me um, 2019 was the last big year for us after that it's collapsed uh, because of travel restrictions and 
uh, virtually haven't been out of India for 15 months now for the first time in 14 years. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the usual challenges of an entrepreneur, um, you know, right now. So I'm unless you want to talk about it, uh, I think it's um, an exciting time to see what can be changed in the business model and be a little more. Um, what can I say? Weatherproof mm-hmm. um, versus uh, just hang in and wait there for the world to become normal and right. get back to what we were doing. So, what what landed you in? Okay, so two questions really. So, what landed you into photography? So, uh, at what age did you kind of get a camera and then go and say, "I I I like this. I like using this as my mode of expression." Right. You know, it's a very interesting story. My father is a photographer. Oh, okay. Uh, he he ran a studio. Uh, he was employed by the archaeological department as an archaeology photographer. Wow. Okay. Um, so that's where it he, comes from. Okay. And he also taught photography. So that is also something which uh, is important in my life. Wow. But I must tell you something. I had never imagined I'll take pictures. Hmm. Um, I, I do have a photo of mine when I was four years old with some kind of a camera taking pictures of a neighbor uh, girl who was posing for me and that's uh, the earliest um, memory or let's say a document of me holding a camera how old were you um, four four years old yes <laughs> <laughs> so that's because you know i was born in a studio i used to play hide and seek in my dark room and no friend of mine could catch me because they were all afraid of the dark room um so i don't know if you guys know what's a hide and seek uh, i'm sure it's sure, very similar sure. in all parts of the world sure so um that was my background but then my father also used to provide photography services to my school. Okay. Which means uh, he would he would come and take pictures of events at school, cultural programs, and fancy dress competitions and prize distribution ceremonies. And I never um, thought that was a great thing to do because I would see a lot of my classmates' parents give him instructions that mm-hmm. would like our daughter. Uh, to be positioned here and there and my father was the service provider as a kid i would never feel good about you know my classmates mom or dad instructing my dad to do something sure and psychologically i never enjoyed um, imagining being a photographer myself mm-hmm. but i must admit um, involuntarily i was learning stuff uh, being in the studio in my summer holidays i would i would sit in the cash cash uh, you know uh, counter and i would start billing people and back in the days in the 80s and early 90s people would walk to a studio to take photos and there was no digital photography yeah. so that was the time when i used to see the business of photography mm-hmm. um, but never inspired to do photography because i was not passionate about the genre uh, my father was into which was pictorial photography or um, you know studio photography mm-hmm. commercial photography and stuff like that so only when I was 19 and 20, I started uh, gaining independence to go farther and, and started going to the forest. Um, the first time I went there was just as a bike ride and to a place where there was no traffic. And then I realized how much I liked the forest. Mm-hmm. As a kid, I was always interested in nature, but then didn't realize that it would be such a passion. So once I knew that I'm madly in love with nature and wildlife, uh, it just happened that the camera became... Uh, a tool for me to use to express my passion. Mm-hmm. So that's how it started. Wow. Jayanth, I really appreciate you you taking the time and, and, and sharing uh, just a little, a little crack in the window of your work because it's amazing. And thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me to join this. I'm looking forward to uh, the outcome of this. Uh, I'd be <laughs> very happy to share it with people. Like oh, me. for sure. For, listen, thank you so much. And and best of health. I don't know how things are in Bangalore uh, in, in terms of COVID. I mean, I, I hope nobody in your family or circle has been really impacted by by covid and i know i know india right now is is going through some really difficult hard times so best of health to you to you all really thank you thank you ryan thank you very much shooting it raw yes shooting it raw